Welcome to the fourth installment of the ACWS webinar series in conversation with Lewis Cardinal. Today's webinar is about building relationships. This webinar was made possible by our generous funders, community and social services. ACWS acknowledges the traditional lands upon which we live, work and play. We recognize that all Albertans are tree people and have a responsibility to understand our history so that we can honor the past, be aware of the present and create a just and caring future. ACWS celebrates and values the resiliency, successes, and teachings that Alberta's Indigenous people have shown us, as well as the unique contributions of every Albertan. The ACWS office, located on Treaty 6 land, which is the traditional territory of the Plains Cree and an ancient gathering place of many Indigenous peoples for thousands of years. These lands have also been home to, and a central trading place of, the Blackfoot, Nakata, Assiniboine, Dene, and the Métis people of Western Canada. We honor the courage and strength of Indigenous women. We honor them as life givers and caregivers as we honor and learn from their continuing achievements, their consistent strength, and the remarkable endurance. Our members and the participating shelters in this project serve all nations and all peoples. They are located on Treaty 6, 7, and 8 lands across this province, which includes the six Métis regions of Alberta. So I would like to welcome Lewis Cardinal, who will be leading this webinar, and there will be space for questions at the end, so uh, feel free to type those into the chat box and think of them as we go through this webinar. So welcome, Lewis. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be back and uh, to be able to share some thoughts and hopefully some insights that will be of use for, for all the brothers and sisters that are out there right now. I want to reintroduce myself again. My name is Lewis Cardinal. But my Cree name is Sipigo Gisik, and that means blue sky. And when I was given that name, uh, the, um, the ceremony leaders were talking about the work that I would do in my life, and that is to build bridges between two worlds that don't understand each other, so that people can cross over to either side, not necessarily just to the middle and meet and shake hands and go home, but to go to the other side to learn the gifts and the wonderful things that are on either side of that bridge so they can learn from it, so that they can share and carry on that tradition of who we are as Canadians. So I'm very honored to carry that name and, and to do that work is pretty much how it uh, defines me in the work that I do. Today's uh, topic uh, is, is one of the big ones. It's called building relationships. And building relationships is, um, it's an art, a science, and a ceremony, that's how I always uh, look at it, is that it's, uh, it's so critical to how we have relationships with each other. My elders have, have taught me that uh, one of the most critical things, uh, one of the most critical problems that we have in our society today is that, as they put it, it seems that we have forgotten how to have relationships. So we have to go back to some foundational concepts and some ideas and some traditions that would really help bring together communities to work together. Canada is rich in its diversity of people. That means it's rich with its ideas and its opportunities. And so we want to take advantage of that and help build better communities and relationships. It's really going to serve each other. It isn't about one part serving another. It's about how we help each other. So we go back to a very a traditional concept that I had shared earlier, and that is the verb kanata in Cree. And kanata means to make pure, clean, and sacred. In order to achieve that, though, we have to make sure that our relationships are in order. We have to make sure that the relationship that we have with ourselves as individuals first is in order. Uh, it is believed within our traditions that the person is made of four parts, the mind, the body, the spirit, and the emotions. And these four parts, when they are in balance together, brings you into harmony with the rest of the universe. So we've got to make sure that we're doing the right things for ourselves first, because if we cannot help ourselves, we cannot really help others. And that's a basic truism that I've heard many times with, with elders. But once we, when we do that, then we have to make sure that our relationships with our with our loved ones, our close friends are also maintained in order. We have to make sure then that our relationship with our family, our extended family, our community are in order. We have to ensure that our relationship with the spirit world, the cosmos, Mother Earth, all of these things are connected to each other. So we always have to endeavor to make sure that these relationships are in order. 
and it's all about relationships. And that's what the elders have always said, is that it's all about relationships. Because in order for our planet and our reality to exist, our relationships need, need, need to be in order. And that's why Kanata then becomes a very important word. And I think a way in which we can look to um, re-seeing Canada, revisioning who we are as Canadians, is that when we listen to the name of our country, when we read the name of our country, and when we sing O Canada and we see our flag, it's asking us a question. It's asking us, what are we doing today to maintain relationships, to keep things in order so we can maintain that balance and harmony and achieve the true greatness of what this country is. Again, going back to that richness of diversity and, and the many people who come here from many parts of the world. So the relationship aspect then becomes critical and it's tied directly to Kanata. Ceremony brings us together for balance and harmony. It's a way in our traditions, not only indigenous people's traditions, but traditions from all around the world, ancient traditions of how we come together, how we share, and how we share with each other. It's a form of unity through action. I like to call it calm unity because it's, it's a way in which we come together to, to share with each other uh, each other's knowledge and wisdom. And, uh, and then we, what we do is, uh, go back to the next Just slide, please. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important though that, uh, uh, that this, it, this is a way in which we respect each other's uniqueness. Because each person, it is believed, comes with a gift, comes with knowledge and wisdom that they've carried with them through their experience in life and who they are and, and, and what their spirit is. So when we come together to build relationships, what we're doing is we're opening the door to that potential to allow in creativity, to allow in insight and wisdom that otherwise we may not have. It also speaks to the tradition of treaties, calling on the principles of treaties, because treaty relations are more than a legal agreement. Of course, we talked about that last time. It's a covenant. We are all treaty people is what we say to each other and that our actions matter. The document is not just a, uh, a dusty old parchment. It is, it is a user's manual, if you will, in terms of how we need to act as treaty people in respect with each other. And these are the principles that are tied directly to Kanata and to uh, the traditions of understanding ceremony. All of these things are tied together. Because when we come together as, as two different com communities, for example, and I've seen this happen in a number of different uh, instances, when you sit and you talk and you listen to each other with earnestness, with honesty, you create common ground. Because we are not as different as we think that we are. Oftentimes it's the communications that can get in the way. But there's processes in which and how we can communicate with each other to make things clear. Because any opportunity for, for dialogue is an opportunity to uh, reset a relationship, to repair a relationship, to create a relationship. And these opportunities for dialogue go a long way in helping communities or organizations coming together to address issues that are, that are common to them. The relationship is about learning each other. It's about coming to know each other. And oftentimes, particularly in this era of reconciliation, this is the time when we really have to come together. It's not a one-way dialogue. It's a dialogue between Indigenous people. It's a dialogue with Indigenous people and Canadians. It's about learning each other again, remembering who we are as individuals and honoring that. And it's about taking the time to reach out to the wider community. And it's a worthwhile investment. That's there's an essence of wisdom in that coming from the traditional teachings of our elders. If we go out to the wider community and talk with the people, as Elijah Harper had once said to me, he said, reconciliation will never happen unless the people sit and talk with each other. So when we start developing relationships within communities, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And that's exactly what we are doing is because we're bringing together a unity. Because the community is strong. And it becomes even stronger when there is trust. But you can't achieve trust unless it is built by sharing. And those opportunities for dialogues then become very critical once more. Learning to trust, 
and the willing to learn. Oftentimes when we start initial conversations with other organizations or communities we work with, it's a, it's a difficult step to take because it, it takes an, an act of courage to step into that unknown because you don't know exactly where you're going to be or where people are at. But that's where you start to learn to trust yourself and to trust the process and to trust what it is that you're trying to do. And when we approach communities, particularly indigenous communities, we still have, unfortunately, a sense of distrust inherent, and, and rightfully so on many occasions. But when people come to my community, for example, and say, I want to I wanna help you, or how can I help you? That is not necessarily the best way to start a relationship. What I recommend people do is saying, I've come here for your help. I need your help. I need to know how to make better relationships. What can we do together to learn from each other? Because you don't want, we see a lot of savior complexes that come into these early relationships and it shuts down things before we can even get started. Because there's a built-in attitude or sense of uh, righteousness that kind of turns off the relationship before you even get started. And then taking that initiative to learn, to understand their way of doing things. Opening yourself up to something new is always another act of courage. But when you learn how they work and how things are done within a particular community, and they differ, every community I've gone to, indigenous or non-indigenous, have a different rhythm and spirit to their community. And when you, when you listen to them, you listen to their stories, you start to understand how they approach things and what are inherently valuable to them in relationships. From that comes priorities and outcomes, but they're not set by a timeline. And we have to think about that as well and what that means, we'll get to that in a moment. But, but also when we come together, we should be coming together in, that, in celebrating each other, celebrating one another, celebrating the things that, that we found. That becomes a way in which you start to build a strong foundation in that relationship. The cornerstones of maintaining good relations then are, are four areas. I'm sure there's many more, but the ones that come to my mind more, more clearly is consistency. Indigenous people have always been visited by individuals who will promise the world and promise all these ones. Sure, they come there with good intentions, but usually they come there only once. And the way that a community starts to trust, and I believe this to be true for many other communities, rural communities, is visit regularly, connect often, let them know that you are always there, go and visit. So having that consistency and, and being present when you are in their community is a way in which you start to build that trust. Oftentimes, you might not get the responses you need the first couple of times that you go, but if they know that you're, you're respectful and that you know that you want to approach it in a very constructive way, and that you need that they they need to help you or that you're asking them for their help it takes a little bit of time and but when those connections are made and they feel comfortable with your with your approach and, and your respect then they start to open up you start to learn things and one of the key things that you learn together is respectfulness is respecting each other's ways and respecting the ways of the community not making the assumptions that things should be this way or done that way and reciprocity is another one. Gift giving to each other. Give in return. A part of our traditions as indigenous people is, is, is the process of gifting each other, not necessarily just in material goods, which some of that helps because it's always nice to receive something from a good heart, but also gifting each other with, with stories and knowledge about who you are. Because I think when you do that, what happens is that you're, you're presenting yourself in a more open way, almost, um, almost to a point of vulnerability. But being responsive also is very important because you want to work to build open and honest dialogues. Responsiveness is how you can respond in rhythm with the community to issues that, that may arise. So that responsiveness is, is a very critical cornerstone to how these relationships can be, can be built. And story. And here's something that is often under, underlooked and underestimated and perhaps even undervalued in, in some communities more than others. 
is the power of story. Story as method and methodology as well. To share stories, because story is a, is a knowledge delivery system. The story tells so much about uh, an individual in more ways than, than, than we can find in, in a resume or, or a community um, description on the website. It creates a deeper understanding of each other. And also telling stories by, by other means. And don't be afraid to laugh either. Uh, you know, Indigenous people are, are very humorous and they enjoy the use of humor. So it, because it opens you up again to that, to that point of vulnerability that you are laughing and showing all your teeth and, uh, and having, having a really nice time. Because when you, when you start to use these storytelling techniques, you can start to see yourself in another person's story. That's when a thread is cast between the two of you where a bridge can be built. Because when you see yourself reflected in their story, you start to become a part of them and a part of their story as well. So I've always advocated. So instead of us saying, okay, what, uh, this is what we wanna do, let's, talk a, let's tell a story about, about something. And so that's always a useful way of, of having those discussions. Because when it gets down to it, once you have identified that common ground and, and what the issues are, you can get to the logistics and, and the planning phases of what needs to be done. But you're not going to get there unless you haven't built that, that natural sense of, of relationship with the Indigenous people. And then when you were starting to work together and develop the possibility, so if you're working with a, an Indigenous community and, and you're trying to help them work with their, uh, with their uh, violence on women issues and their shelter issues and their housing issues, you want to work with them in a way that, that helps them to work with you to develop a communication plan. A set of principles of dialogue is always foundational before you start to come to that understanding of respect, openness, honesty, understanding solutions in the sense of seeking solutions together. Working with elders and women is central. There's always the, the formal uh, elected officials or appointed officials. They are fine. We have to pay respect to them as well. But I've always found that when you start to work with elders and, and women within the community, you're really getting down to what the people are seeing on the ground. And sometimes leadership doesn't see it, sometimes they do, or they just can't act on it because it's, it's, there's, there's so much to be done within indigenous communities. That's why it's important to know the formal and the informal leadership in the community. Within our traditions, there, there are always people who know, and, and elder, the community always knows its, its, its leaders, and not necessarily just the elected leaders, but there are people who have natural gifts, gifts and ability and have demonstrated um, their work and their merit in the community by doing what they do very well. And the community knows who they are. The community also knows who, who their elders are. So it's always worth it to make sure that you do respect the formal leadership. Let them know what you want to do within your community. Ask for their permission to work with the community. And, uh, and then when you start to work with com community, ask the community, who else should we be talking to? Because again, the community knows its elders and, its, and it knows it, its natural leaders. Because there's a lot of them oftentimes, if you don't pick them out of the crowd and bring them in to give them some advisement, that you're going to miss some, some potentially great ideas or potential solutions that, uh, that might be in, in the community. So maintaining relationships is critical and one of the experiences that I did have and I'm going to talk about this a little bit is the Edmonton Urban Aboriginal Accord relationship agreement dialogue process was the bigger bigger name of it but this was done back in 2006 and how we started this process how do you bring together such a diverse multifaceted indigenous community in Edmonton it was difficult but what we did is we didn't say, we didn't go to the indigenous communities here and say, well, you know, do we have a plan for you? We actually went to the formal leaders, the elected leaders. We went to the um, organizational leaders. Then we went to the, um, the community leaders, the ones who are doing work on the ground who are supporting things. And we know who they are. Uh, they're doing it in their own professional way or in their volunteer capacities. And then we went 
to the women and we had a council from the women. We then had a council with the elders with this question and our business leaders as well. With this question is how can we better support the indigenous community in Edmonton in relationship to the city of Edmonton? So rather than coming in with a fully charged plan of how we were going to do it, we asked the first question to them is how should we be doing this? How would you like to be approached? And the reason why that worked really well is because it gave them it gave them the, the empowerment to say, this is what we think is important. Here are the questions that we think you should be asking. Because fundamentally, the community knows what its needs are. And to be honest, sometimes plans are put before a community gets to be involved in it. And so you really don't get to address some of the issues directly as, as you could. So with us, we developed a, um, a process, a very simple methodology to work working together and first what we did is that we made a commitment to each other and this is within the indigenous communities with the city of Edmonton our political leaders as well that we would commit to work toward an agreement and by doing that we would explore issues first we listen to each other very carefully in terms of what it is that we thought were important issues to be discussed and then we would together discover what the co those common interests were and how we can support each other to, to identify those common interests, but also then taking that next step together and creating options. What can we create that is not the same old, but something that perhaps is inspired and sponsored by the creativity of the community itself? So within the Edmonton region, and there's 100,000 Indigenous people here, we sat in circle, we use a consensus process where we ask people to agree to these issues before we move them on. And that's what made it really challenging. What we did use were, were the talking circles. And the talking circles were the critical part of this. Because as you know, when you sit in a talking circle, you're giving an opportunity for each person to share their own thoughts. And for many of these talking circles that we had throughout the whole city and church basements and, and, and boardrooms and, and uh, Fort Edmonton and different places, we people w would say, this is my concerns, is this what I'm really ticked out about, and this is what I think should be done. And, they, and I said, was there anything else? No, that's all I wanted to say. Because they felt that they're being heard for the first time, and that was something that was really important, that there was a sense of being listened to and actually heard. And as we moved on, and I'll show you a document on that in a moment, as we moved forward, then what happened was, is that uh, we, we were reflected their thoughts and because it was consensus any point along the way everything could have been stopped slowed down and when and if it was we would take the time to sit and have circle and talk about what is what is stopping this from moving to the next phase it, it isn't necessarily a bad thing actually what it is it allows you to reflect more on a problem point and seeking clarity for it to help find that that, that solution because when you're stuck on something, there's something that is, is not being recognized collectively that could pop up later on in, in your relationship development. So being creative, though, was, was the important part to this process. And so we created from that the Your City, Your Voice report uh, in February 2006. We, we released it. And if you look at the appendices to the right, what that was, was not only some of the statistical information that we put together, but also what we did is we captured every single phrase of what every single person had to say. And when we'd have a talking circle, we'd have note takers off to the side and they'd write down everything that a person said, encapsulating it to the best of their abilities, but having it up and on the wall so that everyone had a chance to review what they said, because maybe we didn't capture it right. But what that did is that it respected their voice. And it also gave them an opportunity to maybe change it a bit or, or, or strike it from the record or whatever they wanted to do with it. But it was there and we didn't assign a name to it. So within the Your City, Your Voice Report appendices, what you do find then is uh, all these single points that were made by, the, by community members. And it's kind of a thick little bit of a, a report, re <laughs> report, but it helped to under, underline support the actual report itself that came up with 22 uh, recommendations and, 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 those, and those sorts of things. 
But what was interesting is that when we released it and we had a great big community celebration, we handed out our, our reports. There were elders there and community members who went racing to the appendices book and pointed out to their grandchildren or their friends, this is what I said, this was mine. You know, because when it was there and then they compared it to what the uh, recommendations were, they can see it reflected in what the issues and the recommendations and priorities were from the community. So they felt a part of it in, in, a, in a big way. And then, <clears throat> of course, honoring our voice is that the, the critical part of this is that we were looking for a few things. One is challenging facing urban Aboriginal peoples, requiring new ways of working together, because we have that as a fundamental question. If we are to work together, what new way of working together do we need? And they eventually came up with some wonderful, wonderful um, uh, possibilities and, and ways of doing it. The importance of working relationships, uh, effective collaborations already exist because we didn't re want to rewrite uh, or reinvent the whole wheel. But what we needed to do was augment relationships that were already there. So there, you're not throwing everything out. You're actually augmenting what's there and creating new things as you needed to move on. And then, of course, we ask if the question, if we need a relationship agreement and a core, a set of principles and values that can help lead the community in future dialogues. So the guiding principles, what we did, and you can see the full document to the right there, is that we broke this accord into a set of guiding principles. And the important thing about this is that we didn't come, and this is the wisdom of the elders, they said, let's not say we're gonna hire, you know, 5% more indigenous people and here and this, and we're gonna solve the housing crisis by this year, or, uh, you know, eradicate poverty forever sort of thing. They said, let's be practical. We, ha we don't have a good relationship. We haven't had a good relationship with the city of Edmonton for a very long time. What we need to do is set these principles as the foundation. And then what happens is that community comes in with their ideas and builds upon those relationships to create new ideas. And so the four areas of, uh, of the guiding principles were relationships. So relationships read, enhance and promote positive perceptions and attitudes between Aboriginal communities and the city of Edmonton by listening carefully to one another, acting respectfully toward one another, recognizing and respecting each other's protocols and processes, and honoring each other's values. Under agreement, explore and create agreements that enrich community life by creating solutions that work for everyone, respecting the knowledge and experience of Aboriginal community members, business leaders, and professionals, recognizing each other's responsibilities, ensuring the agreements acknowledge the past and focus on the interests of future generations. And in celebrations, we talked about share the gifts of our relationship by, and celebrations are really important, identifying the milestones of this growing relationship, sharing the stories of our relationship, marking and recording our relationship successes, celebrating together our achievements. And that, that part was really important to me because oftentimes when we do all this hard work as community workers, we forget to celebrate, to lift our head up from the grindstone and to see how far we've uh, come along and how much we have, uh, how much we've created. Renewal, of course, is something that's equally important as well. Renew and strength this, uh, strengthen this relationship by honoring the spirit and intent of this agreement, utilizing this agreement to guide our learning and relationships, acknowledging this agreement as a living document to be reviewed on a periodic basis to maintain accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, and responsiveness, and continually rejuvenating and recommitting to this agreement. And with that last part, with a renewal, that was very important because rather than just having a, uh, uh, a one time off, we needed this document to be flexible enough because we also were aware that there would be times of conflict. There'd be times when we would not accomplish the things that we said we were going to do. There's times when you when you forget the, 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 the principles that, that are guiding you. In this way, with renewals, you're actually giving each other permission to call on each other when we're not performing the responsibilities that we know need to be done. And by doing that, you're addressing issues before they arise into conflict. And that's, that's, a, that's a very important part. So <clears throat> when you, you have to be aware 
of cultural rug points. And this happens all the time. You'll always run into it. But we say build your relationship process together. One thing that we learned through this process and other processes I've been involved in is that if one side of the relationship builds, builds the process, then it doesn't necessarily reflect the interest or the perspective of the other side of the relationship. And it takes time to, to build that relationship process together, to identify with each other what is going to be the important points and how you're going to work together. You have to be aware of inflexibility and expedience. And, and this is what I've seen. I've seen some great relationships kind of get ground down because of this pressure of time or this idea that by certain 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 agreements or certain standards that might be on one one side of the party's uh, uh, experience than the other is that, that if you're not in, in flex if you are not flexible to be able to bend with some of the needs with the other community that can that can stop a process from uh, moving forward but equally the issue of expedience trying to get something done quickly is always a danger when you create the process together, you should trust the process because in the end, the product is the process. How you do something is how the relationship is. And I also suggest that you think of time as a baseball game. And this is what indigenous people do around the world is that there are certain things that need to be done before another thing can happen. It's just like a baseball game. You have three batters up, three batters go down, and then that's one inning. And then you have nine innings. Sometimes a baseball game can take uh, two hours. Sometimes it can take four. But it cannot go forward unless those elements of the game or the process are done first. So you got to take the time that you need to accomplish things that are really the milestones and the goals that you're trying to achieve before you move in other elements. Um, because that really does respect and honor the process in a way that acknowledges that priorities within the community are being honored. We need to meet those expectations and we need to be able to, to put them before us rather than thinking of time. Well, we've got two months and we've only gotten to, to, one, uh, to one part of it. Take the time that you need. It's always a difficult thing, but it's not impossible. Things can move. Things can be accepted. Um, and pledge to seek solutions to differences. And that's, all, that's, a, that's a huge one, is that when you do come to differences, because we always will, uh, it doesn't matter what community you come from or what relationship you have with different organizations, there will always be differences. But there could be a way of working through that to learn some new information. And that's why I say there could be gold hidden in, in, that, in that difference. You may find something else that you're not really aware of by doing that. And practice clarity, seek clarity. I've seen most of the problems that happen within organizations or interpersonal communication uh, conflicts is because not understanding what the person is saying or what the person means. And it's not just practicing like for me speaking clearly or, or trying to be clear about my point, but it's also me asking the other person if I am not clear about what it is that, that they're saying and uh, or, or doing in this case. Well, I think <clears throat> when you are addressing such a sensitive issue like that, um, then my my advice is that you, you speak with the indigenous women of the community because they're the ones who know that issue uh, so much more than any professional that you bring in. There, there, are, there are experiences in which they can bring to the table and, and knowledge that perhaps we don't see about their community and cultural traditions as well that need to be respected and honored. Um, they will provide a very strong foundation in terms of what, of what can be done. And it doesn't mean that because you may be someone not from that community, they will respect, if the approach is done properly, they will respect your, your, your professional skills and even your life experience as well. But getting to that point about talking about really difficult situations is always dependent on how your, your, your relationship is being developed. And so addressing 
that particular issue is one that's very sensitive, but also again, it takes the time to have that conversation. And I've seen, I've seen meetings take place where an organization who wants to help them and their intentions are good, but they come in with 20 questions and they have a council of people there who want to have a discussion, but there's 20 questions. And usually you don't get past three at the most. So brevity, I guess, would be another another way of, of, uh, of saying that, is that you can get a lot more out by posing questions that are a little bit more broad um, than you can with asking uh, 20 specific questions, because you're just not going to have enough time. Oftentimes people, and this is my experience, is community members, regardless of where they're from, probably have not been asked by anyone what they think about anything. And so when you create this opportunity for them to share, take the time to listen to them. You know, take the time to say, okay, um, share, share your thoughts. And, uh, but as, as, a, uh, as a person who's, who's trying to formulate relationships and communities, I always found that uh, uh, brevity and, and questions and points of discussion have to be uh, conducted in a way where you leave the door open for a lot of conversation. Again, because if you focus the question too much, it may, it may limit the responses, might limit uh, some insights that can enlighten the whole thing for, for the whole community. So it's just giving that respect and, and that point of, uh, of support for the community members that are there as well. And the first, I think the first protocol that we have to honor is that you never try to do something in an indigenous community without its leadership, its elected formal leadership knowing why you're there. So the first step in this protocol is go to the leadership and tell them what it is that you're looking for, what kind of help you need to accomplish the work that you do. So that becomes a very important process. And I think just taking that simple tact kind of uh, releases any, any suspicion that might be there. And, and you know, there's a lot of leaders today who, who really do understand the complexities of issues. And so they're willing to, um, to an extent, a hand to, to help themselves deal with some of these issues as well. But if we start appearing in the community without, uh, without invitation, then that can be a problem that they need to know why you're there. There's legal implications for that too, I would suppose. But then once you've entered that, the first beeline I make it to is the elders, to talk with the uh, elders senate first or the elders council that they may have. And, and again, approaching them with, uh, with your hat in hand and, 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 your, and, and your questions and asking for that, that assistance to help you to do what, what you need to do. Um, then, then the women become really important. Sometimes you can do one or, or both at the same time. Because the women, again, are the ones who really are seeing what's happening on the ground. Not that anyone else is, but usually they have more of an insight in terms of how how their own children are interacting with, with, with this particular issue. So it becomes an important por portion of that is to seek the women's insights. Again, you know, it happens to be that there's more males in, uh, in leadership on First Nations than there are women. It's slowly changing, but generally you need to have that insight from women. But also, it helps to get the insight from youth as well. That becomes a, a very important um, part to get a, a broader view of what's happening in the community. And then, and then what you're doing is that you're always reporting back to the formal leadership. This is what we're doing. This is, here's the thing of consistency, right? You don't just go to the elders once. You don't just go to the women once. But you go back, and you come back with what you think you heard for clarification on their end. And then once you've done that, you're, you're demonstrating again that, that uh, respect for what it is that they shared. And so then when that is done, when they've had a chance to review that, then you bring back, you know, perhaps a structure of something that they build together in terms of what they can do in their community to support their women or, or, or other issues. And the question was asked before about, uh, about protocol. And, and I think that's a really important thing. I didn't expand on that very much or, or at all. Protocol is, is very important because one thing is that when you work in these communities, you want to bring some some spiritual things like tobacco or, or, 
or things like that. You're honoring their information because what they have to say is going to be sacred. So participating as well, as I've recommended before, in, in community ceremonies, everything from a sweat lodge to a round dance to a powwow, letting people know that you're there and that you're there for, for the long haul. So by participating in these sorts of things and, and functioning in a way that honors their traditional protocols, um, and the respect tends to, to rise a lot more in, in terms of how then you can ask them for, for help in achieving what you, you need to do. The wonderful thing about a talking circle, I call it a power tool, because when you're sitting in council with each other and you're sitting in a talking circle and there, an issue has, has arisen, you are trying to explore what seems to be the source of the conflict or the difference. I don't, I don't like the word conflict so much because it's really about difference and it's how sometimes one difference might assume that it's you know, more important than another, or one solution is more important than another. That's that's the part of trust that's that's really critical. Is that because at this point, if difference is not addressed and a solution sought to address it, you can have you can have a longstanding separation, and then you spend a lot of time trying to repair that. When conflict arises, attention should be put on that specific issue so that you can address it, go through it, get to understand it. Because when you do understand the issues, you tend not to repeat it again. It's not 100%, but you tend not to repeat it again. Because you've sat down and you've, you've done your dialogues. Now, the talking circle isn't just about listening to each other. It's also a healing process. You know, and, and the things that we found and the experiences that I've had in working with community development utilizing talking circles and indigenous processes is a lot of times there's a lot of misinformation and misinterpretations or just pur purely not hearing what another, another person said clear enough that can create that can trigger a sense of emotion or or, or create a misunderstanding that kind of gets in the way of, of, of moving forward so the talking circle then becomes a, a very important tool because as it's being facilitated, and usually what you do is you'll get someone that the uh, the community or, and you both agree would be the person to help mediate the talking circle. So you'll be a part of it, and then you come in first as human beings to talk about how you're feeling about things so that you know where that emotion is coming from and exploring it. So you really do dig in deep with some of these things. But also as a person individually, you can discover certain things that may be triggering you as well that affects your decision-making process uh, too. So it's, um, it's a very powerful tool. Ultimately what happens is that once you start to explore that emotional side of it, you start to study the, you start to approach the intellectual side of it. That means you're starting to examine what is the logistical problems of what might be happening. So then what you do is you start to lay bare the, the construct of what the, or the disorder of what the uh, the issue may be that's causing uh, a resentment, uh, struggle, or, or misinterpretation. And then once you identify that, then you start to identify uh, ways in which you can address those weaknesses in the, uh, in the relationship and be able to get it out and be able to look at it and say, oh, okay, this is where we all went wrong in different areas. So, but it can be done. And then also then what happens is that you, you've done a healing process as well because you're no longer carrying it here. It's out on the table. Let it take.